today's program is the indomitable Florence Billings. Florence Billings was an extraordinary person who lived a remarkable life. I'm happy to have an opportunity to tell you about her. I'll also focus on her sisters, Anna and Charlotte, as all three women made Bedlands their homes and challenged expectations for women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Billings sisters were originally from Hatfield, Massachusetts, where their families settled during the colonial era. Their parents were Frederick and Francis Billings. Frederick was a successful farmer. He and Francis had four daughters. Anna was the oldest and was born in 1861, followed by Emily in 1864, and Charlotte in 1867. Finally, Florence was born in 1879, so she was significantly younger than her sisters. Their paternal grandparents, Charles and Charlotte Billings, were abolitionists who aided the Underground Railroad in Massachusetts. Hatfield, Massachusetts was part of an extensive network of Underground Railroad stations throughout the New England area. These communities helped protect free and formerly enslaved people from being arrested and enslaved, particularly when the Fugitive Slave Law went into effect in 1850. It's difficult to know for certain, but it appears that the family was well off. Florence's mother, Frances, was the niece of Sophia Smith, who was the founder of Smith College, which is a woman's college in Massachusetts. And Sophia Smith inherited wealth from her family. Florence's father, Frederick, was named as a trustee of the school when it opened in 1870. The family's life was upended when Frederick died in April 1885 at the age of 53, leaving Frances with their four daughters. This newspaper article states that the couple had five children, but I could not find any evidence that any other children were born after Florence in 1879. At the time of his death, their three eldest daughters were in their late teens and early 20s, and Florence, their youngest, was only six years old. At some point after Frederick's death, their eldest daughter, Anna, attended Smith College and graduated in 1891 at the age of 30. It's unfortunate that I was unable to find much written about Anna. Like many women of her day, Anna pursued a career as an educator. Teaching was one of the only acceptable forms of employment for women in the 19th century. And even that was only acceptable until they married. At the time, there was a shift in understanding women's roles in educating children. So the idea of educating women to become educators themselves became more commonly accepted. Despite that, women who sought an education often encountered barriers. The prevalent ideas of the day stated that educating women was unwise, unnecessary, or even unsafe. So you can see that there was a perception that an educated woman was a problem. As I mentioned earlier, Sophia Smith College, where Anna attended, was a women's college. It was founded by Anna's great aunt. By the time it was founded in 1870, great strides had been made for women's education in a variety of fields, including a ruling by the University of California Regents in 1870 that decided that women should be admitted on an equal basis as men. The American Association of University Women was founded in 1881, and so Anna and her sisters benefited from many advancements when they pursued higher education. Not long after Anna graduated from Smith College, her mother decided to move the family from Hatfield, Massachusetts to Redlands. They are first recorded as arriving in March of 1892, at which time it appears Francis purchased a property on the corner of Palm Avenue and Alvarado Street. Construction on the new family home began about a year later at a cost of $5,000. The family moved in at some point in the summer or fall of 1893. I'm not sure if they lived in Los Angeles or in a boarding house in Redlands prior to the completion of their home, which uh, is still there at 417 West Palm Avenue. The property was a recipient of a Redlands Area Historical Society Heritage Award in 1988. A few months after the family decided to move to Redlands, 
Anna was offered a job teaching French and German at the University of Southern California. She later moved to the school's English uh, literature department. She was hired in August of 1892 and was given housing at Hoge Hall Dormitory, which you see pictured on the left, and worked out of the College of Liberal Arts, which is on the right, uh, photographed a couple of years after she arrived. In announcing that she was hired, the Los Angeles Evening Express newspaper wrote, Miss Anna Billings has been elected preceptress in the university for the ensuing year. She will also occupy the chair of modern languages. She became the chair of the English literature department the following year. The reasons for the family's move across the country are unclear, but it is possible that it may have had something to do with the health as Emily, the second eldest daughter, passed away from tuberculosis less than a year after the family moved into their home. It was common for people who were diagnosed with TB to move to drier climates in the American West, and Redlands was one of those destinations. Trinity Settlement opened in San Timoteo Canyon in 1901 to treat people with TB who were not affluent enough to afford individual treatment. This was not the case for Emily, but sadly she died in February 1894 and was buried at Hillside. There, her death record states that she was a teacher like her sister Anna. Anna worked at USC for a couple of years before moving to Riverside where she taught for a short time. And in August 1895, she left California to begin an English literature program at Yale. She graduated with honors two years later. With Anna away at school, Frances, Charlotte, and Florence settled in in Redlands. The women became very involved in the community, particularly with the First Congregational Church, where Charlotte became involved in the Young Ladies Society. Frances and Charlotte also joined the Altamira Club, which I unfortunately was unable to find much information about or, or to learn more uh, other than the excerpt that you see here. And she describes it as quite a society gathering and included 14 ladies, including several members of the Sanborn family. It's possible that the group was a reading club, as we have this photograph in the collection that identifies some of the same women dressed up for a, quote, colonial party as part of a reading club at Irene Hornby's home. Fortunately, the women are identified, and we know that one of them was Charlotte Billings. So at least we have one photograph of Charlotte. Charlotte was also involved in the Contemporary Club from very early on, an involvement that continued throughout her life. She was also a member of the Redlands branch of the Women's National Indian Association, serving as treasurer in 1895. The Women's National Indian Association focused on the forced assimilation of Native peoples by building homes, missionary colleges, schools, and chapels, as well as by supporting government teachers, field agents, and doctors, all in the name of Christianity. The group was not unusual in its approach, and it was also not always successful. According to historian Valerie Mathis, the group's contributions to the welfare of Native women are, were hardly insignificant, especially in California. The youngest Billings daughter was Florence, who graduated from Redlands Union High School in 1897, the same year as her sister Anna graduated from Yale with her PhD. The graduation program took place at the Academy of Music Building, which you can see here. It was the largest graduation from the three-year-old school to date with 19 students earning their diplomas. 12 of the 19 graduates were female. After graduating from Redlands Union High School, Florence attended Stanford University, earning a bachelor's degree in Latin in 1903. Here you can see the school's memorial arch, which was situated at the entrance to the main quadrangle leading to Memorial Court. The arch was 100 feet high and was erected by Jane Stanford in 1899. It was hollow, and visitors were able to climb through the inner set of stairs to a viewing platform above. 
The stone cap visible at the top was erected by a sculptor and showed depictions of progress of civilizations in America, as it was called, and it was completed in 1902. Here's a view of the arch just three years after Florence graduated, showing the damage it sustained during the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. You can also see its uh, hollow interior. The heavy stone cap above was dislodged by the earthquake, which also caused large crevices to open. The falling masonry caused damage to the building around it. After the earthquake, the arch was considered a low priority. It was never rebuilt. The two columns on either side remain have been capped with red tile roofs. Florence went on to receive a teaching certificate and taught at Paris High School, which you see pictured here. The grammar school was on the first floor and the high school was on the second. Anna also continued her teaching career in Southern California, teaching at Redlands Union High School and Long Beach High School before moving to San Diego to teach at the normal school. Her mother, Frances, may have moved to San Diego with her at this time. Sadly, Frances died in San Diego in 1907 with paralysis listed as the cause of death. She was buried at Hillside with her daughter, Emily. While Anna, Charlotte, and Florence handled the details of their mother's estate, Anna moved back to Redlands and taught at Redlands High School, and the sisters inherited the home on Palm Avenue. They sold it about a year and a half later. After her mother's death, Florence traveled throughout Europe. She studied in Germany, visited Russia in 1912, and eventually began to teach English in a private school in Germany. Here you can see a letter that she wrote to her friend Helen Fisk in 1912, telling her that Florence was spending the winter in Berlin. You may remember Helen Fisk as one of the women I discussed in the Women in World War I webinar a couple of weeks ago. Florence remained in Europe and was vacationing in Brittany in the summer of 1914 when World War I began. She realized she couldn't return to Germany and immediately joined the war effort in France. She was not alone. Service organizations were mobilized with new groups formed as soon as the war began. Even American service organizations, including the YMCA, YWCA, Salvation Army, the Red Cross, among others, joined the war before the country entered the conflict. Florence first volunteered with the American Ambulance Hospital in Paris, which had been established at the beginning of the 20th century. When the war began in 1914, the hospital sought to care for soldiers regardless of nationality. Florence wrote to her sisters about her experiences in the hospital. One letter was published in the Redlands Daily Facts newspaper in December 1915, where she wrote, quote, as far as horrors and the way of wounds go, I guess I've seen about the worst there is, short of those who die before they can be taken away from the front. I was awfully done up this summer, not from work, but from seeing and hearing it all. But I seem toughened now. The men are very friendly and amusing. In that same letter, she also informed her friends and family that she was leaving the ambulance service and joining the American Fund for French Wounded. That organization was formed by Anne Morgan, who was the daughter of J.P. Morgan, and was staffed by American women living abroad to help wounded soldiers in France during the war. It was originally under a British organization, but became independent in December 1915, which is when Lawrence joined. As she relayed in her letter, quote, I'm joining society which undertakes to help out the smaller French hospitals, mostly those in the provinces of Normandy and Brittany, which are dreadfully in need of everything, and also to help French and Belgian refugees. She spent much of the next year helping the group before returning home at the end of 1916 to continue to advocate for the fund in the United States. She joined Charlotte and Anna, and together they visited various places in the United States, including Massachusetts, Florida, and Virginia. She gave public presentations at many of these places, including in St. Petersburg, Florida, where the paper reported that she spoke of bringing a gas mask as a war souvenir. And then in Lynchburg, Virginia, where she spoke of the importance of the Red Cross and Red Cross comfort bags that were given to soldiers. She also gave vivid descriptions of battlefields, where she described small French flags 
across fields marking soldiers' graves and hundreds of figures kneeling beside the graves in mourning. While Florence was busily fundraising for the American Fund for French Wounded, President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany and the United States became involved in the war in April 1917. While many Redlanders were already doing their part to support the war, the city of Redlands mobilized at this time and a Red Cross chapter was established. As you may recall from the previous webinar, American relief organizations came together under the banner of the United War Work Campaign to aid the war effort with each group being tasked with a different responsibility. The Red Cross was tasked with looking after sick and wounded soldiers during the war. They aided both civilian and military victims and offered many different types of services at canteen workers, first aid, care of wounded or displaced soldiers, prisoner relief, search assistance for wounded or missing soldiers. Nearly 20% of Americans joined the Red Cross, including Florence Billings. After about a year away from Europe, Florence joined the Red Cross and was assigned to be a canteen worker in France. She was living in Boston at the time, and it appears her sisters may have been with her. She departed from New York on November 17, 1917, aboard the Chicago, which was one of the first transport ships to carry American Red Cross canteen workers to Europe. Here you can see her passport application and photo. Canteens were established very close to the front lines, putting them in dangerous positions. As you can see from Florence's quote here on the screen, Red Cross workers fed thousands at the canteen, but in their spare time, they also did nurses' duties at the hospital. There are terrible stories of air raids and bombardments that left Red Cross workers dead or permanently injured. An estimated 348 Red Cross women lost their lives. Some were killed in air raids and artillery bombardments. Others died or were left debilitated by the diseases and disorders bred by the filthy and worse than primitive conditions along the Western Front. The exact number of women who were injured is unknown. There are individual stories, however, that leave no doubt as to the seriousness of some of the injuries. When a hand grenade accidentally exploded near a rider and Red Cross worker, they sustained wounds that kept them hospitalized for two years. A woman doctor caught in a gas attack suffered burned lungs. A study conducted in 1920s revealed that among the women injured in the war, at least 200 were permanently disabled. Florence served at the famous canteen on the Marne, where heavy aerial bombardments started three days after her arrival without interruption. She wrote home to her family, describing the frightening conditions she worked under, writing about one incident in particular, where she stated, quote, at 2.30 exactly came the most awful noise I ever heard. It seemed right over our heads, the whole building shook, glass broke, etc. Right on top of it came a second and then a third explosion. The canteen workers were forced to sleep outside in case the canteen was to be bombarded while they slept. She later remarked that the women of the canteen showed no signs of being affected by war, but went about their duties with confidence and deliberation. She was one of several women who were awarded the Croix de Guerre for their service during the war, an honor which was obviously well-deserved. Florence was still on the front lines when news arrived that the war ended on November 11, 1918. She described the relief expressed by soldiers writing, quote, the men were quite happy. I should think they would be after four years of war, with so complete a victory. There are long trains of artillery coming back from the front all with guns covered and everyone at ease. Each artilleryman is singing his own happy little song and beams on you as he passes. Very different from three months ago when they were clanking up to the front, all ready to go into action. It is surprising how little enthusiasm or outburst there is among the men here. Florence returned to Paris after the fighting stopped and helped at a hospital at Léon Valide, which was originally established as a home and hospital for aged soldiers and still serves that purpose to an extent, in addition to being where you can see the tomb of Napoleon. 
As you see here, she wrote to her sisters about her experiences in the hospital, including how the men taken there once the war ended were those with terrible injuries that were either fatal or permanently debilitating. She described her time at the hospital as being worse than the war. The Breadlands Daily Facts continuously published letters written by Florence to her friends and family, and that is how we get some of these wonderful quotes. Florence remained at Paris for a time living at the American Women's Club and took the opportunity to travel through battlefields again as she had in 1916. And in this April 1919 letter, she described traveling through France writing, quote, the country is one ridge after another as bare as your hand. It is only by looking at the green country back of you that you realize that it is not nature, but the effect of war. She continued by writing, the entire route was lined with cemeteries. They told us that when the troops first went up to the line, one cemetery had only three graves in it. Ten days later, when they came back, there were 4,000 graves and the dead lying so thick on the route, you would never have thought one had been buried. In the same letter, she also states that a friend of hers, Edith Parsons, invited her to, quote, go to Turkey on reconstruction work, all expenses paid, and a small monthly allowance. This offer was for a one-year period, and Florence expressed interest but was unsure of the commitment. And despite her initial apprehension, Florence did accept the offer and began to work with the American College for Girls in Bursa, Turkey, which had been established by American Protestant missionaries in the 19th century and was instrumental in the development of Near East Relief. Near East Relief was an American organization created to aid with the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide which had begun in 1915 and lasted until 1923, resulting in the death of up to 1.5 million people in massacres and forced marches where people were left to starve to death. The group helped refugees, establishing orphanages, vocational schools, and food distribution centers, and raised $117 million in the United States to assist in Turkey. Hundreds of Americans volunteered to go to Turkey to aid in the crisis. Florence worked with the American Girls School for six months before shifting her work to Near East Relief. She worked under Annie Allen, who was the Near East representative in Bursa. Annie was a longtime missionary in Turkey, having arrived in 1903, and she and Florence became good friends. Florence and Annie were the only Americans in Bursa, Turkey, when the city was taken over by the Greek army in July 1920 as part of the Greco-Turkish War, which began in May of 1919 and didn't end until October of 1922. The war began after World War I as Greece and Turkey were vying for territory while the Ottoman Empire was being partitioned. Greek forces took several cities before being stopped by Turkish forces. In the summer of 1920, the Greek army embarked on an offensive campaign against Turkey in an attempt to defeat Turkish nationalist leaders led by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. This was a particularly troubling period as France withdrew their civilians and the British warned women workers that it was dangerous to remain in the interior of Turkey. Despite these warnings, Florence and Annie moved to the interior of Turkey to Konya as part of Near East Relief's efforts with refugees, particularly orphans, at large refugee centers. This is where Florence's wartime experiences would have served her especially well because the situation was unsafe and foreigners were not usually allowed to go to Konya. Here you see Florence in Konya, Turkey in 1920. She is sitting in the center along with Jenny Jilson, who I also believe was an American refugee worker. And the man seated to the far right is the main doctor at the Turkish hospital where this photograph was taken. And the other men were also doctors. While Florence and Annie were in Konya, a revolution began and the women, other refugee workers, refugees themselves, and orphans had to take shelter in an orphanage. As the Greek military left the area, Florence and Annie toured villages to report on the conditions of the residents. Annie Allen was injured in one of those tours and she contracted typhus while recovering. She died on February 2nd, 1922 in Shiva's Turkey. Turkish nationalist leader Mustafa Kemal Ataturk arranged for a military guard for her funeral. With Annie's death, Florence became 
the Near East Relief representative in charge and was stationed at the American Hospital in Ankara, the Turkish capital, where she was for a time the only foreign woman in the city. And there you can see Florence pictured at the center of the photograph. Two years after the Greek offensive of 1920, Florence was appointed to inspect Greek prison camps in Athens in December 1922. And as you can see in this newspaper article, she submitted a report to Near East Relief about what she found. Florence took on this mission on behalf of the Turkish Red Crescent Society, which requested that she take on this project personally. She found that there were about 20,000 Turkish prisoners in Greece, of which 14,000 were soldiers, and requested that the Greek government compile a complete list of prisoners to be sent to Near East Relief. She took several thousands of letters for Turkish prisoners from families at home and returned with letters from soldiers for their loved ones. According to a newspaper report, she also delivered nearly 1 million cigarettes to the prisoners. Here you can see a photograph taken of Florence in Constantinople in 1821, and then the reverse states that it was taken by a French person, perhaps a soldier. This photo and the previous one that showed her with the doctors are part of the Florence Billings collection at Smith College. One part of her story in Turkey that is particularly interesting is her friendship with Turkish nationalist leader Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who I've mentioned a couple of times. She knew him personally and spent quite a bit of time at his palace and the two were friends. Ataturk came to power after World War I as the Ottoman Empire was being dissolved and the Turkish nationalist movement got underway. The movement resisted attempts to partition Turkey amongst the allies and engaged in what is now known as the Turkish War of Independence of which that Turkish war was a part. Ataturk became the first president of a new Turkish Republic in 1923 and embarked on programs to build a modern Turkish state. He issued various reforms, including giving women equal civil and political rights and the right to vote. The name Ataturk means father of the Turks, and it was given to him by the Turkish parliament in the 1930s. Florence wrote about her friendship with Ataturk in a letter home to her family in Massachusetts in 1922, where she referred to him as a fine and courteous gentleman and described daily meetings over tea at his palace. He gave her an autographed photograph, which she treasured for the rest of her life. Florence also corresponded with Turkish nationalist and feminist Ali Dey Adib Azivar. Ali Dey was a novelist and political leader for women's rights, which won her praise from Western women, including Florence Billings. She was active in the Turkish nationalist movement and was granted the rank of sergeant in the nationalist army during the greco turkish war. Alade ran an orphanage for 800 Armenian refugee children in Antura, and Florence was instrumental in gathering hundreds of Armenian and other war orphans and arranging for their transportation to Smyrna and other places of asylum. The orphanage worked towards the Turkification of these Armenian children, and those who resisted were beaten and starved. Children were given Turkish names and forced to become Muslim and stripped of their identity as Armenians. There are some terrible stories which may have been unknown to Florence and the other Western women who admired Alade's views on gender and what they saw as her humanitarian efforts. Florence left Near East Relief in 1923, but returned to Turkey several times later in her life. Returning to the United States, she joined her sisters and traveled around the world. Charlotte and Anna had not held permanent addresses since they sold their Redmond's home in 1909, but they spent much of their time there. The three sisters spent the next couple of years traveling around the world, including to the Middle East. In 1925, Florence traveled to Iran, where she was introduced to the Iranian Prime Minister and soon-to-be Shah of Iran, Reza Khan Pahlavi, by the former American ambassador. She described the meeting in a letter where she wrote, we motored to his Garden of Delights, four or five miles from the Tehranian border, along an old road. Its dust kept down by men stationed every so many places who threw water upon it from a ditch. He spoke in Persian in a low tone and rapidly. He answered my questions frankly and without any attempts, even at diplomatic evasion. I asked him too whether he believed in higher education and more freedom for women of his country. He said he did, but that it would have to come slowly. 
The following year, Florence enrolled in a master's program at Columbia University and graduated in 1927 with a thesis entitled Causes of the Outbreak in Sicilia, Asia Minor, April 1909. Here you can see the Columbia campus as it looked in 1926 when Florence was there. When she wasn't traveling, Florence called Hatfield, Massachusetts her home around this time, while her sisters were mostly situated in California. By the early 1930s, she settled permanently in Redlands and became active in local affairs, as well as the uh, American Association of University Women, Contemporary Club, the Trash and Treasure Club, and Associated Charities, to name a few of the groups with which she came to be affiliated. She purchased a home at 506 Walnut Avenue and entertained frequently at the Wissahickon Inn, which you can see pictured here. Her sister Charlotte was a regular winter guest at the Wissahickon Inn and spent summers at Lake Arrowhead, Santa Barbara, Berkeley, Carmel, and Alaska, and visited places like Fridalba in the San Bernardino Mountains. It appears Charlotte was constantly entertaining at home. Florence also continued to travel the world. She went to Africa in 1935 and gave a presentation to the Missionary Society of the Congregational Church of Redlands where she described the beautiful landscape, including visiting Lake Victoria and a trip to the Delta of the mouth of the Nile. She also discussed European colonialist control of the continent. In 1937, she went on a six month vacation to Europe where she planned to attend the coronation of King Edward VIII, but changed her plans when he abdicated. His brother Albert was crowned in May 1937 as George VI, and you may know that George VI was Queen Elizabeth's father and that her uncle's abdication is what led to her reign as monarch. In the same trip, Florence visited France, Sweden, and Russia, where she had visited once before the war. And as you can see from the newspaper clipping on the right, she described Moscow as a drab city where it had once been picturesque. She also said that, quote, the Russians seem to be leading a very dull life. They are consumed with a passion for rebuilding, but outside of their work, there doesn't seem much for them to do. She also described colorful homes being demolished and replaced, and people who had once dressed in a variety of clothing, now all dressed in light. She was in Moscow for a theater festival and spent about 10 days there. This 1944 article of a planned road trip through Italy tells of her trip with Minnie Butler, who was the wife of Massachusetts politician William Bone. The pair prepared to travel Italy in a Model T Ford. And the article refers to Florence's car as the Indomitable, a nickname which was earned for, quote, the sturdy resistance with which it meets the most difficult traveling conditions. The idea for the trip came about after Florence made a similar journey with her sister Charlotte through the French Pyrenees the previous year. Anna and Charlotte were considerably older than Florence, as you may remember. Anna was nearly 83 years old when she passed away in Los Angeles in August 1944 after a brief illness. She was buried at Hillside Memorial Park. Charlotte passed away five and a half years later at the age of 87 in February 1951. She was also buried at Hillside. Florence was featured in the spring 1941 issue of the Western Woman magazine which featured women of the Inland Empire. The magazine billed her as having distinguished war service and detailed her time in Europe during the war and in Turkey after the war. She also described her many trophies, including the autograph photograph of Ataturk and her Croix de Guerre. She volunteered with the Redlands Red Cross during the Second World War and remained active in the community throughout her life. Florence Billings died in her sleep at home in Redlands on September 9, 1959 at the age of 80. I was first introduced to Florence Billings through the research that Dr. Ann Deegan did on Redlanders who served during the First World War, and I became fascinated with her story as it unfolded through research. She obviously lived an extraordinary life, and I realized that her freedom was made possible by the wealth that she and her sisters were fortunate enough to enjoy, but I also admire the way that she lived her life and I'm grateful that I had this opportunity to share it with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to help us commemorate Women's History Month.